are going to start a brand new series today. Look at your neighbor and say, it's the beginning of the month. <laughs> so that means new series time. Let's shift it up a little bit. And um, I don't know how far I'm going to be able to get through this message today, but I'm super, super excited. In fact, um, today is one of the days where I, ca- I, I, I woke up yesterday morning with one message, and I went to bed last night with a completely different message. I was going to go through a story in Scripture, but instead we're going to look at something a little bit different um, than, than I had plans, and I really believe the Holy Spirit is in this in a really big way. Uh, we're going to start a new series called Church words. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say church words. Or if you want to say it like this, somebody calls it Christianese. Come on, somebody. Christianese. We have our own language sometime. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Um, since, we're on the, since we're on this kick of talking about the cussing belanges, um, if you weren't here last week, that won't make sense to you. But if you heard this, we're going we're gonna to keep going in that vein a little bit. Don't worry. There's no more that I've got about dad. This is about myself. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, but, um, but in other countries, there are English or American words that mean completely different things. I don't know if you know this. This is real. And this hit me in a really uh, direct way one time because about five years ago, I came into contact with a missionary uh, guy that I became really good friends with and that he watches uh, online. And, and we're still friends and we still talk. And he is from Scotland. And so we were working together in Thailand about five years ago. And this is a guy that I'd heard about through the years for a very long time because I've been working in Thailand since 2008. And this is a guy they had told me about because he's been coming to this orphanage every Christmas. This guy spent Christmas at this orphanage every year. I think this was his 29th year this past Christmas. Um, And a really cool story. Uh, This is a guy who was a professional cyclist. And he had a really bad accident at a a professional cycling event in Europe um, and broke his neck, had really bad uh, head trauma. um, And through the grace of God, God brought him basically back to life. He shouldn't have lived. um, And um, he's got this amazing story of God's grace in that area. And now he spends all of his life just doing mission work. And he's a really good friend of mine. So um, when I first met him the very first time, it was kind of cool because he was talking and he sounded like William Wallace. Come on, anybody like William Wallace? Braveheart. Come on, some of you are going, who's William Wallace? Braveheart. Mel Gibson, right? Mel Gibson. All right, now we're getting somewhere. And so I'm a big Braveheart guy and I was just messing with the guy. And I said, you know, I heard William Wallace was really a pansy, and like they really, you know, he wasn't as cool as the movie made him. And he really got, oh yeah, he was. He was awesome, and started defending William Wallace. Well, as we started to talk, there were words that I would say, and he would explain to me how these words did not mean to him what they did to me. Like the word knob, for example. We were talking about a doorknob. They needed a doorknob. I remember having a conversation about a doorknob, and he was like, "Let me tell you what that means to me." And I'm not going to tell you what it means because it's not good. But it was not a doorknob, okay? And so, because I wasn't saying doorknob. We're from the South. We shorten everything. Come on, somebody. We, we, so I said, it's a knob. And then I talked about pants one time. We always take the kids shopping and we were going to get pants. Well, I didn't know that where he lives, pants are not these. Pants are underwear. And I was telling them to go get pants for the kids. And he came rolling up in with a big bag of underwear. And I'm going, what are you doing? We can't let the kids go to school in these And it was just one of those moments where you see like this, but it really got funny because at the time, my brother, um, you know, who tries to be Mr. Cool, Mr. Hipster, he's out of town today, tries to be Mr. Cool, uh, fanny packs were coming on back in. I don't know if you knew this. Fanny packs came back in. Isn't that wild? Like, this is crazy. The fanny packs came. Well, fanny, and some of you, they never went out, but that's okay. It's another (laughs) story. Uh, Fanny packs came back in and... um, my, I remember uh, my brother was wearing his fanny pack, and I kept picking on the fact that my brother, because at the, I mean, I hadn't seen anybody wear a fanny pack in forever, and so I was picking on my brother, and every time I would say fanny pack, this guy's eyes would get real big. And finally, he pulled me over to the side, and he said, he, I, I would try to talk Scottish, but I'm not, I'm not even going to try that. He said, he said, Brother John, he said, I would appreciate it if you wouldn't use that language. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, where I live, fanny is a very bad word. 
And so being the good Christian that I am, what do you think that I did? I talked more about fanny packs the rest of that week than I could have ever done it because it was just too funny to me that I could talk about a fanny pack. And, and still to this day, every time I talk to him, I ask him, you got your fanny pack yet? And he says, John, I tell you to quit saying that. And uh, he always gives me a hard time. But it's just, it's one of those things where sometimes we have an understanding of a word and somebody else has a different understanding of a word. And sometimes we're not on the same page. In fact, um, any Friends fans, anybody a, a fan of the show Friends? Anybody remember the episode where, where the encyclopedia salesman comes to Joey's house and he knocks on the door and this is what he asked Joey. He says, hey man, he said, you ever had that moment where everybody's in a conversation and you had no idea what they were talking about so you just nodded like you knew what everybody was saying and then Joey goes through all the moments in his mind of all the times that that happens for him and then Joey realizes that hey, these encyclopedias are something I need so I can learn what some of these words and these concepts actually mean. That's what this is going to be. I'm gonna be the encyclopedia salesman. You're gonna be Joey for a few weeks and we're gonna look at some words that you may or may not understand, okay? Because there are words, how many of you know there are words and, and and as a pastor, as a communicator, I'm going to be honest with you. It is getting harder and harder to talk on a stage in front of a large group of people because there's such an array of knowledge. More and more, there are people who don't know basic Christian terminology or what we would call Christian terminology. Basic Bible stories. I was so uh, disappointed in my oldest daughter yesterday. They were playing a game at uh, the pool yesterday with, with her and Addison and my other daughter. They were playing a game, and, and they said, and it was this thing where they would say, think of a such and such that starts with the letter blank. And if you did, you got to go across the pool. And my daughter says, um, uh, Bible characters that start with the letter M. And so they were trying to figure out what they were. And, and uh, one of the kids was struggling trying to figure out a Bible character with the name M because all the ones they knew had been taken and then um, Arabella said duh Moses the guy that built the ark <laughs> preacher's daughter baby you know you got to be proud and I said sorry honey Moses didn't build the ark he didn't and so got to have a little bit of a bible story yesterday at the pool so we have these words these bible stories and it's getting hard to communicate because sometimes I'll use language that I assume that you understand and you may not and so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next few weeks really looking at some of these words psalm chapter 119 Verse 130, yes, that is correct, verse 130, largest chapter in the Bible, says this. It says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And you know what I've learned in my life is there are a lot of people who want to use words and give words, but they don't want to unfold words. And so what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time unfolding some words so that we can take hold of these principles, that we can really engage them and live by them. And I'm just gonna be honest with you. Today, we're here on this Sunday morning, and I'm not sitting here with an assignment to get you excited. I'm here on an assignment for your life to be changed. And that's what we're gonna do. So the first question I wanna ask you today before we look at today's word is, how many of you want right now, you just need a change? And you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to, you don't have to do it. It's a rhetorical question. How many of you would honestly say right now in your life, you're like, I just need a change? Then today's word is going to be perfect for you because we're going to look at a word that probably many of you have heard, but I don't know if you really understand the truth and the power that this word holds, and it's the word repent. Very churchy word. How many of you ever heard the word repent? Yeah, you heard that word? Very churchy word. But what does it mean? The Bible gives us a couple of passages about the application of this word and how it should be applied. Acts chapter 2 verse 37 may be my favorite uh, time that the word repent is ever used because this is at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This is the message that Peter is preaching. And at the end of the message, it says when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And we're going to come back to that at the end. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we? do they were cut to the heart and they said what do we need to do and this is what Peter replied with Peter replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit every one of you 
Again, in Acts chapter 17, we go further in the book of Acts, verse 30, it says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. It was talking about the Gentiles and pagan worship and idol worship. It says, in the past, God overlooked ignorance. In other words, this idea, what does ignorance mean? It doesn't mean that you know it and you don't do it. It means that you don't know it and you did it anyway, he says, in the past, God overlooked ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So we see that word again, repent. So this is a, this is a word that obviously the book of Acts teaches us that everyone needs to be engaged in. Every one of us need to live, live lives of repentance. It is not something we do once. It is a daily application to my life that we repent. Everyone, look at your neighbor and say, everyone. Everyone. Say, that means he's talking to you. (laughs) Repent, repent. And I think sometimes when we hear the word repent, I think we think of all these different things. I think there are some times when we hear that, we think, well, you talking to, you just say repent to riffraff, come on. Heathens. Sometimes when we think about the word repent, we get a picture of this, of this old man in the Old Testament with a big beard, got manna stuck all up in his beard. And he's screaming at everybody, repent, repent. Sometimes we think about John the Baptist, the guy who had the beard with he was eating bugs and all of this stuff, weird guy sitting in prison, still yelling at everybody, repent, repent. And we think somehow Jesus comes on the scene in the middle of all of that and says, don't listen to that old kook. He's about to lose his head anyway. Don't worry about him. I'm going to sprinkle fairy dust on everybody and everything's going to be all right. But Jesus actually doesn't ever end the season of repentance that John the Baptist starts. In fact, we're going to see in a moment that Jesus actually continues that word. And he takes it to a place that people never knew it could go. So repentance is something for all of us to be a part of. It is something that all of us need to be applying to our lives. There are words in scripture for repent. There are are two words in the Old Testament, but there's only one primary word. It's used 391 times. It's the the word shuv, but it's not spelled S-H-U-V. I should have wrote it down on the board, but I won't. I'm going to save time today. It's it's written down S-H-U-W-B, shuv. And and this word that we read here, it means... um, to turn or to return is what it means. In the New Testament, there's a Greek word that is used that is called metanoeo, metanoeo. And what metanoeo is, is it was actually more of a military term. It would be to like make an about face, right? And, and anybody ever been uh, played basketball? Um, you remember your basketball coach taught you how to what? Pivot, right? Pivot. You make that quick turn, that is what the word literally means. It is to turn. Um, another trans, I mean, another uh, definition of it is actually this idea of to change your mind. It is not just a physical turn, but there's this mindset change that happens in the moment of repentance. And we're gonna look at all of this in just a moment. But the primary thing is, is, is understanding, hey, I'm going in the wrong direction. I have to stop and I've got to turn around. I have to take a moment and, and I probably don't need to, but it's just too good of a story. And I think I may have even told it, but it's my favorite story about going the wrong way. And he's not even here today, but let me tell you, we got a guy in our church that is one of the greatest human beings on the planet named Timmy Brady. I love Timmy with all of my heart. He is an incredible heart. He's an incredible man. He serves this church faithfully. He is probably watching with his family right now. They're on vacation. He is not here, but there's this hilarious story that I have to tell you where there was a moment they were in they were living in Detroit, Michigan and they were gonna and I may mix the states up but this is the general idea uh, uh, they, they were in Michigan and they were gonna go on vacation and they said they got in the car and Timmy looked over at his wife and she was wearing some shorts and he said her legs was looking good come on man we've all been there and he said he looked down at her, his good-looking wife and started rubbing her knee and rubbing them legs. He said, them legs were just looking so good. And he said he got on the road and they was going on vacation. And he said they were supposed to be going to Wisconsin. And four hours later, they looked up and the sign said, welcome to Ohio. He went the wrong direction on the interstate for four hours because he was looking at the wrong thing. Come on, somebody. He was looking at the wrong thing. That's what happens in life. That's what happens. We get our eyes set on the wrong thing and we end up going the wrong direction. 
And there comes a point where we have to realize it's time to turn around. All right? Paul wrote this. This isn't going to be on the screen. He says, the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome but kind to everyone, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of truth. Now, this is interesting because in this passage in 2 Timothy, Timothy, there's this, there's this conversation that Paul is writing to Timothy where he goes against what he said earlier in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, he says, hey, there's going to come a moment in your life where you know you need to repent. But here in 2 Timothy, what does he say? That there's gonna come a moment where maybe God will give you, he will grant you the, the heart to repent. And it looks like there's a little bit of friction here between these two passages. Because then we ask ourselves the question, so what is is Scripture teaching me? Is Scripture teaching me that God gives me the ability to repent? Or is Scripture teaching me that I need to make the decision to repent? And this is my answer, yes. Yes. There is this thing in our life that moves us to repentance called the Holy Spirit. In fact, in our understanding of the Holy Spirit, this is the best example I could give to you. Anybody remember what this was? A little bit of a thing that doesn't, but you remember you thought you were somebody when you had one of them hanging up in your car, didn't you? Come on, y'all remember them days? Yeah, no, I, no, I, got, I, got, the, I got the five-inch screen. You used to put this in your car, and you were, you were able to what? You were able to set it up with a different voice, you remember? And all the women pick the guy because it sounded like he was an attractive man because he was from like Britain or Australia or something and you thought Thor was leading the way everywhere that you went, right? When, when men did it, they also said it to the, the cute man voice, not because they were attracted to the man, but because they didn't want to be told by a woman what to do any more than they had to be. And so they chose not to use the woman voice. Come on, men are looking around like, yep, that's exactly right. That's what we did. We refused to use the women's voice because women tell us what to do in the car anyway. And so if there was going to be a differentiation of voices, we had to do the man voice. And what this would do is, is you would put in a destination, And as you were trying to travel to that destination, this would guide you along the way. Am I right? And even if you took a wrong turn, which happened, even with these, isn't it crazy? It was rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. You remember this? Rerouting, rerouting. Do a U-turn, rerouting. Turn left, rerouting. Do a U-turn. That is what the Holy Spirit does for us. I want you to get this image. This is who he is. He is this voice in our life that wherever we go, it doesn't matter how far off course you get. Listen to me. He knows how to get you back. Come on, somebody. Am I right? Does anybody else know that as a testimony of your life, that no matter how far off the path that you get, there is something inside of me that is inherent. There is something built into who I am that says, no, 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 turn left, turn right, do a U-turn. We will get you back so that you can get to the original destination that God has for you. I'm so grateful that the Holy Spirit is that for my life. And that is what Paul tells Timothy, that we have this voice that is leading and guiding us. But that is not all that we have. We also have one of these. Now, I don't know, some of you may not even have any idea what this is. This is called a map. There was a time that it came on paper. Look at that, isn't that crazy? I mean, can you imagine riding down the road, driving, going... That's what people did. Anybody remember trying to fold maps? Come on. Isn't that the worst? Like how can folding a map be so terrible? So not only do we have the Holy Spirit guiding us, but we also have what the Bible calls a lamp or a light to the path. These written down words. And that is why, listen, you need to have a desire for yourself to get into this word because there are things in there that you can't see on a GPS. Listen to me, and this is what I wanna show you. A GPS will say, all right, turn left here, do a U-turn here, but you can't look at a GPS and see beyond that one turn. 
The scripture is that thing in our life that helps us be able to go. Listen, it's not going to say you need to marry this person. It's not going to say you need to take this job. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He is the one that guides us in those moments, gives us, as we talked about last week, those rhema words, but the Bible is the one that gives us the ways because here's what I want to be. I want to tell you who I want to be. I don't want to be the man who knows God's actions. I want to be like Moses. I want to know God's ways. And this goes beyond just the action of what I need to do, and I can really get down to the ways of who God is. And then on top of that, there's a third thing that God uses in our life, and we call these things road signs. Come on. Pay attention to the road signs. We believe in signs and wonders around here, and signs is just as important as wonders. Because along your journey, there are going to be signs that pop in and you are going to have to recognize, nope, I'm going the wrong way. Nope, I need to turn around. Sometimes those signs are, which which I don't know where we stole this from, from, so don't ask. (laughs) Somebody is not going to have a stop sign this morning. That's all I know. Sometimes those signs are very obvious. They're very big. You remember when Jonah was told to go to Nineveh? And he turned and went the opposite direction and God put a road sign in his way called a fish that swallowed him. That's a big sign. Come on, can I get a witness? Can we agree with that? That's a big thing that says, all right, you're going the wrong direction. But then there are some, there are some signs that God puts in our way that are very subtle. And then if you're not careful, they're very easily missed, like Pharaoh's dreams, when Pharaoh's having dreams about what direction Egypt should take, and he's having dreams about cows, skinny cows, and fat cows, and big sheaves, and little sheaves, and nobody even knows what a sheave is. And Pharaoh had no idea what this sign was about, but it was a little subtle way of God trying to help bring direction so that he can make a turn in his life to make a wise decision to get to the destination that God had for him and his people. And if you're not careful, I want you to listen to me. You will miss the signs in your life. You have to be very mindful. You gotta keep your eyes and your ears open to what God is placing around you to say, okay, is this a sign showing me that I'm going in the way that God wants me to go? And listen, there are gonna be times that there are negative things that come your way that will be a sign that you're going the way that you need to go. Am I right? Come on, does anybody agree with that? Every sign that God puts in front of you is not a sign that's like, woo, yeah, yeah. Sometimes he's going to put some friction along the way. Sometimes he's going to put some speed bumps in there, and there's going to be some things that you got to go over and go through. Every now and then you're going to hit a dirt road with God. Come on, am I right? But you pay attention to the signs to make sure that God is taking you where you want to go. So let me give you three things about repentance real quick, and I probably am not going to even get through all three of these, but we're going to do the best that we can do. Number one and the most important one that we're going to talk about today Repentance is more than saying sorry. Repentance is more than saying sorry. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but Hurricane Nana hit again yesterday, and she hit hard. One of the, one of the, the, the angriest and uh, most um, rebellious times I've ever seen my youngest daughter it was yesterday and, and as I was preparing for this message I'm just watching this unfold because we've all as parents been there where they say they're sorry come on but their actions don't change <laughs> anybody am I the only one and so Nana yesterday we're trying to go to a swimming pool to have fun with the kids and Nana is just not having a good day She is angry. She is yelling at her mama. I mean, yelling at her mama. I mean, Tiff had to make me leave the house because she was about to be murdered. Um, Tiff said, you need to leave. You are going to hurt our daughter. I mean, she was angry. And then she kept saying, we would say, if you would just quit yelling and be nice and quit being upset, we will take you with us to the pool. I am nice. I'm not yelling. 
Now, you got to remember, around our house, passion is a core value, okay? All right? And so we don't see these as negative things. We see this as, as things God put inside of all of us. And I'm a yeller. She's a yeller. So she's yelling. She's like, I'm sorry. And she's throwing stuffed animals at my wife while she's saying, I'm sorry. And you're just going, I can tell. Like, man, you are just so sorry. I think we've all been here with our kids, right? How many times do we do that? with our own life to where we just go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But we never have a change of mind and we never have a change of direction. And we wonder why the things in our life that come to pass don't change. Because repentance is more than saying sorry. Sorry is a word that we throw around all the time. In fact, yesterday, Addison Rhodes was at our house, and Samantha and her were in a little bit of our, it was just a good day around our house, and Addison looked at Samantha and said, you're mean, and Addison said, sorry, and Addison said, I don't think you're really sorry. Because it's a word that we throw around, and when people use it, we don't always believe it, we don't always trust it. What we trust is what people do after they say that they're sorry. That is the gauge of how sorry we actually are, and to say sorry is just not enough. Listen to me, God does not want you to be sorry for sin because I have counseled people on a daily basis throughout my ministry, and I've watched people be sorry all the way to destruction. Because their actions never change. Their mindset about what it is never changes. And so Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. We're going to look at this passage twice today. But for the first time, let's look at it. He says, We repent to turn to God from our sin." Sin can be defined, if you want an easy definition for me, this has always been my general definition. I don't know that you'll find this in a book anywhere. This is something that I just kind of came up with through the years, and maybe I've heard bits and pieces of it through the years, I don't know. But sin for me has always been defined as anything that violates a divine standard. Anything that violates a divine standard. And we're going to look at that in great detail in five weeks. We're not going to look at that today. I don't want to jump into that. But I want you to know that that is how I define sin. Sin is not when you do bad things. Sin is not when you do things that are wrong. Sin is any time that you violate a standard that has been set by God. And sometimes that standard is not just doing bad things. Sometimes it's not doing good things that God has not called you to do in that moment. It is a divine standard that God has set before you. And the Bible says sin is fun for a season. Can I get an amen for those of you who have been there? And then I have people tell me sometimes, they'll say sin is not fun for a season. That is a lie, and I just want to go, no, you just need a coach. I need to help you learn how to sin better. Because sin is fun for a season. But as Proverbs says, and I read it in the podcast this week, there is a way that looks good but ends in destruction. It looks good, but it ends in destruction. And we've got to be able to recognize anything that is a violation of the divine standard so that we can turn from it and we can move back towards God. Luke chapter 5 verse 32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but I have come to call sinners to repentance. This is the passage where he talks about the hospital. And he says the hospitals are not made for well people. Hospitals are made for sick people. And Jesus says in confirmation with what John the Baptist has already said, I have come so that people will repent of sin. Now, the illustration that I'd come up with is this. Let let me give you this line first. I think this is really powerful. This is really good, and I'm trying to hurt. We're, we're, there's no way we're going to make it through all of this, so we may, we may have to dive back into it later. The fruit of faith is not sinlessness. The fruit of faith is repentance. I'm going to say it again because that is really powerful. The fruit of faith is not sinlessness. The fruit of faith is repentance. You will know a a, a tree by its fruit. The fruit is not. That's why people look at, that's why there's so much judgment in the church. People look around and say, if you know what such and such did, if you know what, who she really was, if you know who he really was, then you wouldn't do this or you wouldn't. No, I know who they are, but the question is not, the fruit of their life is not, is there no sin? The fruit of their life is, is there a heart of repentance? 
that when they do fail, that when they do sin, they turn from it. They have a change of mind. It breaks their heart. Because that's the difference. Listen, Paul talks about this idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11. He says there are two types of sorrow. There is worldly sorrow and there is godly sorrow. And you know what worldly sorrow is? Worldly sorrow is I got caught. Just like your kids. There is no, there is no heartbreak for the father There is no heartbreak for the the plans that he has for you. It is that I got caught, and that is is worldly sorrow. And that is what so many people in the church have, is worldly sorrow. And very few people have what Peter described in, or what Luke wrote it, but Luke described in Acts chapter 2, when it says that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. I sincerely want to ask you a question. When was the last time that you were cut to the heart? I said, what do I do? And Peter stood back up and he said, you repent. He didn't call them to come down and and repeat this prayer after me. Pray this prayer. He said, no, no, no. You repent. Because you've been cut to the heart. You understand what this sin is. And, and, and again, the best example I have of this is, um, anybody like the show When Animals Attack? Come on. Oh, Miss, Miss Yarbrough, you're shaking her head. No, she don't like that. I love When Animals Attack. And you know what? I'm going to be real with you. I pull for the animal every time. Come on, somebody. Because some of these people just do some stupid stuff. And I was, I'll never forget, I was watching this one time. And, and this guy came walking in with a full-grown lion on a chain. And I'm already pulling for the lion. I'm like, this is going to be good. And, and they pull this lion out, and, and they try to show you how, how they got this lion tamed and lion controlled. And they look at the lion, they say, sit down. And the lion sits down, and they bring this model out in a bathing suit, and they're going to shoot a shampoo commercial with the lion. I don't know what a lion has to do with shampoo or a woman in a bikini. But that's what they did. And before you know it, that lion turns on the woman and attacks her and he like mauls her. Now, if she died, I wouldn't tell the story. So she didn't die. But you just want to look at stuff like that. When I see that, I just want to go, well, what did you think was going to happen? Lions do one thing. They eat things. And when they're not eating, they're thinking about what they're going to kill next. That's what they do. And when I watch this stuff, man, and I watch that, I watch what it looks like to have worldly sorrow. Because let me tell you what worldly sorrow is. Worldly sorrow is I'm going to put the lion on a leash instead of kill the lion. And we think that we're going to leash these things up. We think we're going to control these things that were never meant to be controlled. They were meant to be things in our life that the Holy Spirit killed. Let me tell you something. When you allow the Holy Spirit to come into you and your sin life, let me tell you what he does. He puts a bullet in its head. And he waits there and he waits and if it even kicks a little bit, you know what he does? He puts another bullet in him. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It is is not enough to try to tame something that God has called to die in your life. It is not enough to try to do that. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in with a new kennel and a new leash and a chew toy and say, let me see what I can do to fix this. The Holy Spirit says these things have to die. And you know what the cool thing is? The cool thing is, if I'm being really honest with you, I want you to hear me very carefully right now. The cool thing is, is that when you come to church, What you don't realize is there are a lot of people around here that will help you kill your lion. Because we've all come in dragging our own lions. Every one of us. In fact, I'll tell you this. If you're here right now and you don't think that you have a lion in your life, then you're probably in his mouth. We all come in carrying our lions and we're here together so that we could kill these lions. And you know what I've learned? I've learned that if you would just be honest about that, 
See, see, for some of you, man, it is so hard. It is, it is, I want you to know this. I found this in my own life. It is so much easier to repent when I've actually been honest about who I am. It is so much easier to repent when I've had a true moment of confession instead of trying to cover everything up. The, the, the reality is, is that many people come to church and they're afraid to let the real them get known because they don't think that you would like the real them. They don't think that you could love the real them. They don't think you could accept the real them. And when you do that, what you don't realize is, is you are actually setting yourself up in bondage and in the trap of never being able to live a life of repentance because you've never let yourself be really known. And you have to have a true moment like the prodigal son had where the Bible says in Luke 15, what did it say? He came to himself. He came to his senses. He realized at a moment, hey, I've got this lion in my life. This is not God's best for me. This is not gonna help me get to God's plan. And I need to turn and I need to let these things die and I need to move back towards God. The other thing that gets me crazy is, is what, what I think that we forget is that sin is attached to consequence. And in scripture, we see this in many different ways. It is associated with Compton. Ezekiel 18, therefore you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart for a new spirit. Why will you die? I love that. God looks down at his people, he says, why are you dying? I don't know if you've heard this phrase, but Black Lives Matter right now has this phrase that every time I hear it, I think about the church. It moves me to think about the church. That I've heard, I've heard Black Lives Matter say in the news and stuff, we done dying. That's what I've heard them say over and over. And it's time, I say, for the church to stand up and to say, we done dying. We are done letting these things kill us. God is looking there and says, why are you going to choose to die? When you've been called to repentance, he says in Romans chapter six, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. James chapter four, verse 16, when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Hosea chapter 14, verse one, your downfall is because of your sin. Even in Genesis chapter two, in the very first sin, what did God say? If you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And what he shows us in Genesis 2 and many times in Scripture is it's not always talking about a physical death. That is all we think about. There are so many things that die when we allow sin to take control of our life. And one of the things that we fail to see is that there's a consequence that is attached to sin. I want you to hear me. And what happens is, um, Mr. Eddie, JT, come here for a second. Let me show it to you this way. Here, we'll stand up on this level right here. Y'all come up here with me. I want you to watch this because this is what you're doing. Here's God. And what God wants you to do is be as close to him. Yep, there we go. I, sorry, JT, I gotta give it to him. That's right. This is God. And what God wants you to do is he wants you to be as close to him as you can possibly get. There is this thing that God has attached to him that is our bridge called Grace. So we get close to grace. And grace is, is, as we talked about last week, what did we say last week? Grace is the thing that, that actually doesn't just forgive us of our sins, but it actually is the thing that says, no, 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 you need to say no to, God, to godlessness. That's what we read last week. So we're, we're close with grace. So there's no gap for anything else. But when we sin, let me tell you what you do. When you sin, and when we let sin rule our lives, it creates a separation. Grace is still the bridge. He's still your father. But there's a little bit of a separation. And you know what this separation does? This separation creates space for consequence that would not otherwise be there. So when you sin, you are not, listen, Paul said, you can't separate you from, you're, you can't separate from the love of God. That is not what I'm saying. He still loves you. The grace of God is still for you. The favor of God is still pursuing you. But you are creating space for consequences. And then you continue in sin and you create more space. And then you wonder why in the world all of these consequences are happening. And what you want God to do, thank you guys, I just wanted to see that. What you want God to do is you want God to deal with the consequence but not deal with your sin. 
You want to look to God and say, help a brother out. And you want him to fix these consequences and things, but you cannot deal with the consequence alone. You have to get to the root of that consequence because that consequence has a cause. And if you don't get to the cause, then you're still going to be in a cycle of consequence. Does that make sense? We have to recognize what it is, and we've got to turn from it so that constantly, listen, I don't know if you know this. Let me just say it to you this way. Did you know that God has given you the ability to reverse the consequence? It's called repentance. He has given you the ability to reverse the consequence. It is called repentance. And unfortunately, what most people do is instead of spending time trying to let God deal with the sin, is they just decide they're going to make the best of the consequence. Listen, you can still be a believer. You can still love Jesus and let go of repentance for a moment and just be okay with consequence. But what you don't realize is that that's that's not God's best for you. That's not what God has for your life. Because what ends up happening is, guys, listen, what repentance does is repentance brings you back close to the resurrection. You know what sin is? Sin is when life becomes death. Repentance is when death becomes life. Sin is when life becomes death. But repentance is when we decide, I'm done dying. I'm done dying. I'm done letting God's plan and purpose for my life. I'm done letting it die. I'm choosing to turn and to go back to life. You want the ingredients to to repentance? Here they are, three quick ingredients. Number one, you must recognize it as sin. If you're not gonna call it out, it'll never work. You gotta recognize it. You gotta find it. You gotta locate it. You gotta recognize it. Again, just like the, the guy in Luke 15 did, you gotta recognize it. Number two, there must be remorse over that sin. You remember the woman with the alabaster jar? It's one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. I used to preach about it like, multiple times a year. I haven't preached about it in a few years now. Probably need to go back to it. There's this story with this woman who was a prostitute that Jesus rescues. And we don't know much about her history, but I would imagine she had a really good reason to become a prostitute. I only say that because I've worked with many prostitutes through the years, and they all have these stories that break your heart. And I would imagine she could have come to Jesus and made excuses and said, this is why I did this. This is why I became this. That's what she could have done, but she didn't. The Bible says she comes, and she falls down at his feet, and she is crying and sobbing so much that she has enough tears to wash the feet of Jesus. That's a moment that we don't have often anymore. Let's be real. Where I'm so broken. Not because I I fear sin and not because sin is a master. I, I, I get it. Jesus has overcome sin. But there's this hurt that I've hurt the Father. There's this hurt that I hurt the plan that he had for my life. And we need that moment of remorse where we fall down at the feet of Jesus. I mean, when is the last, I mean, honestly, when is the last time you had that moment where you were just broken because you realized that there were things in your life that you needed to turn from? And then the third thing that, that, is, that I wrote down was you have the decision to reverse it. You make a decision. I'm going to reverse this thing. I'm not going to continue on the path that I'm on. Dad, you can come on up. It's more than saying sorry. It's not just, listen, repentance today is not you coming to God and saying, man, I'm so sorry that I sinned. It's about saying, no, 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 God, you have something better for me, and I'm going to turn from the thing that's trying to kill me, and I'm going to move towards what's going to bring me life. The other two points, I'm going to give them to you. I'm just going to read them to you. I'm not going to go through them. I'm going to, number two, repentance always brings a return. One of the things that we don't recognize in Scripture about repentance is because we always talk about what we're losing with sin as we fail to see that every time it's mentioned in Scripture, it is attached to a blessing. 
Repentance is so much more than just leaving sin. It is actually about connecting with the blessing of God. In fact, I was going to do this illustration, and I'll show it to you, where you could take this rope. Repentance is a rope that keeps you attached to everything that God has for you. Did you know that? Isn't that cool? Everything that God has for you, no matter where you go, there's a rope that is attached still to your purpose where God says, if you'll repent, I've got a way back. No matter where you maneuver, no matter where you go, God says, you see, we think repentance is attached to two things. We think repentance is attached to forgiveness and we think repentance is attached to heaven. But what you don't realize is repentance is attached to everything that God has for you right now. If you would just turn and move back towards what he had for you, it, there's a return that comes with it. And then number three, repentance is turning towards the opportunities that God has put before you. Repentance is not always turning away from sin. Sometimes repentance is turning towards an opportunity that God has set before you. And we don't always see that as repentance, but it is. Again, it's a military term. Anybody remember the moment where Jonathan is fighting the, well, they're supposed to be fighting the Philistines, him and his dad, Saul, and they're all asleep. The army is asleep and Saul's asleep under the pomegranate tree. And all of a sudden, God gives an opportunity for Jonathan to get up and to go fight a battle against the Philistines with one sword and one armor bearer and Jonathan is going, this is a dumb idea. I don't even know if this is gonna work, but he says, you know what, God, you put this opportunity before me and I'm, I'm not gonna live a life of safety. I'm gonna live a life of risk trying to get every ounce of life that you have for me. And he gets up and he approaches and he moves towards the enemy and he defeats an entire army all by himself. Why? Because he recognized the moment where God put an opportunity before him to repent. What about Peter in the boat? Peter said, hey, if you're who you say you are, call me out of the boat. In other words, give me an opportunity to turn and do something that doesn't make any sense and show me that you're God. And he calls them out of the boat. And in a moment of repentance, how do I know that it was repentance? Because everybody else was lying down in the fetal position, afraid to die in the boat. But Peter saw it as an opportunity. He says, I'm gonna to turn towards the opportunities that God has for me. So repentance is not just turning away from sin. That's all we see it as. I'm turning away from sin. I'm turning away from sin. Yeah, but what are you turning to? Because if you don't know what you're turning to, here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that if you don't recognize what you're turning to, then you're gonna give up on a life, a life of repentance. Because all you're gonna do for the rest of your life is think about what you're turning away from rather than celebrating what God is turning you to. So I want to invite you today to repent. Whatever that looks like for you in your season, in your moment right now, now that you know what it actually means. It's not you saying, man, God, I'm sorry for my sin. It is you putting a bullet in the head of that sin and turning away from it. Some of you right now had no idea that, that repentance was attached to return, to blessing, to promise. And some of you, God has been putting opportunities in front of you that you haven't recognized. And God is wanting you to turn right now towards them and move.